muscles in the neck. So the first muscle that we encounter if we remove the skin around the neck is called the platysma muscle. It's a very superficial, very thin strip of muscle and it kind of covers the contours of the neck. This is why we can see usually um, the pulsation of arteries and veins in the neck because of the very thin and superficial nature of the platysma muscle. Now, if we strip away the platysma muscle, we'll encounter the sternocleidal mastoid. And so the sternocleidal mastoid, as the name is implying, attaches to the sternum, the clavicle, and the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So the sternum, the clavicle, and the mastoid process, hence the term sternocleidal mastoid. And we can see a better view of the sternocleidal mastoid here. So here it goes. It goes from the mastoid process to the sternum, the manubrium of the sternum, and the uh, lateral body goes to the clavicle, right? So the sternocleidal mastoid. Now, a few of the other neck muscles, um, we call these the infrahyoid muscles um, to distinguish them from the suprahyoid muscles, which are above the hyoid bone. Um, the ones that we are interested in for this course are going to be the ones that are beneath the hyoid bone or the infrahyoid muscle. Now, if you look at the name of each of these muscles, that'll tell you where the muscle is inserting and where it is originating from. So let's go through these one by one. So we've got the omohyoid muscle, and the omohyoid muscle has two parts to it. It has an inferior part and a superior part, and it goes from the shoulder on the clavicle, the, um, the scapula, up to the hyoid bone. So it's inserting on the scapula, and the word omo just means shoulder or of the shoulder region. So, and then it is originating from the hyoid bone, so omohyoid. We've also got the sternohyoid. So the sternohyoid is inserting in the, on the sternum, and it is originating in the hyoid bone. And uh, if we strip those two layers away, this is a deeper dissection here on the right, we can see the thyrohyoid muscle inserting on the inferior aspect of the thyroid cartilage and originating from the hyoid bone. And then lastly, the sternothyroid muscle um, inserting on the um, inserting on the thyroid, inserting on the sternum, excuse me, and originating from the inferior aspect of the thyroid cartilage, right? So omohyoid, sternohyoid, thyrohyoid, which is a much smaller muscle compared to the others, and then sternothyroid. Now remember that thyrohyoid and sternothyroid um, are deeper to omohyoid and sternohyoid. Okay, and here's another view of those muscles. So we can see the omohyoid here on the left. If we were to move away sternocleidomastoid, we would see the sternohyoid from the sternum to the hyoid, we would see the sternothyroid from the sternum to the thyroid, and then we would also see thyrohyoid, which is a much smaller piece from the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone. Let's talk about some of the vasculature in the neck. So the two important vessels that we're gonna look at are the internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery. These are found running together with the vagus nerve in the carotid sheath of the neck. The internal jugular vein is uh, draining blood from the head. Um, and then the common carotid artery is bringing blood towards the head and face and scalp. So here we've got the internal jugular vein. And for reference, we can see the smaller external jugular vein, which is a more superficial vein, draining uh, blood from the face and the scalp, whereas the internal jugular vein is really draining blood from the internal structures, the brain and the head. And then we've got the common carotid artery here. Common carotid artery will eventually split off here, above here, into the internal carotid and the external carotid, which have a similar role, right? The internal carotid takes blood towards the brain and the internal structures, whereas the external carotid takes blood to the face and scalp, the more superficial 
structures. All right, let's look at some of the thoracic structures. So as you make our way down from the head, we talk about the neck. Now we're gonna kind of introduce the thoracic region, some of the important structures here. So if we were to look at the thoracic wall, so here's a picture of the thoracic wall. So basically we remove the entire breastplate and we're looking at the anterior, um, kind of the internal surface of the anterior chest wall. And if we look there, we'll see these small uh, vestigial muscles called the transversus thoracis. And so here's, this, here's the sternum. Here's a posterior view of the sternum for reference. And we can see these muscles that are embedded here in, in between each of the ribs. Also, one of the more important muscles, the diaphragm. So the diaphragm we know is this large dome-shaped muscle. We can see it um, better here in this small schematic here. Um, it is completely separating the thoracic cavity on top from the abdominal cavity below. And as we know, it is involved very, very much uh, in the breathing process. So the diaphragm is one of the major muscles that helps with the relaxation and contraction to uh, allow for inspiration um, and facilitate breathing. Uh, let's look at the thoracic wall muscles. So let's go back to this slide. So in this slide, we also saw some other muscles running in between the ribs. So not these transverse thoracic muscles, but the other muscles that are running in between each of the ribs. These are what we call the thoracic wall muscles or the intercostals. Inter meaning in between and costal meaning ribs. So we've got three groups of intercostals, the external intercostals, and the direction of the fibers is what's really gonna distinguish one of these muscles from the other. Um, so the external intercostals have fibers that are running anteriorly and inferiorly. And these fibers are more superficial and more lateral. The internal intercostal has fibers that are running uh, inferiorly, but posteriorly. So posteriorly, inferiorly, um, so pretty much the uh, opposite direction of the external fibers. And this is going to be the second layer of fibers in terms of um, superficial to deep. And then the deepest layer are the innermost intercostals, and the direction of the fibers here are pretty much vertical, so up and down. And these are going to be the deeper muscles. These are going to be found more anteriorly, more medially, um, and deeper in terms of superficial to deep. Now, these muscles, as we can tell, are also involved in respiration and breathing, but not as intimately as the diaphragm. These are pretty much accessory muscles to breathing, and they're going to help move the thoracic cage more so for forced inspiration and forced expiration. Um, so, the, the, um, so think about being in respiratory distress. You're going to call on these muscles, whereas normal quiet breathing, you're really relying on your diaphragm. Okay, so here's another view of those uh, intercostal muscles and kind of just showing you where the external fibers are. So um, just to orient ourselves, this is a cross section. This is the posterior aspect. This is the anterior aspect. The external fibers are going to be more posteriorly located and more lateral. In terms of depth, we know that they're also more superficial. The internal intercostals are more anterior more medial, and then they're going to be the in, in between, that's sort of the um, in between the external and, inter, and innermost. And then the innermost is also anterior and medially located, and these are going to be the deepest layer of muscles. Let's look at some of the other uh, vascular structures associated with the thoracic wall. So this is a view of the posterior abdominal, uh, posterior thoracic wall, excuse me. And we can see here the vertebral column behind here. We can see the esophagus cut here, the uh, uh, primary bronchi also cut. We can see parts of the aorta as it's descending, and then a few of the large veins that are draining here as well. So when you look into the posterior thoracic wall, in between each of the ribs, we see three uh, neurovascular structures. The superiormost structure, so closest to the inferior border of the rib, is the intercostal vein. The second structure is the intercostal artery. And the third structure is the intercostal nerve. So in that order, we find these three structures, the vein, the artery, and the nerve. Um, 
And so if you're looking underneath the rib, you should be able to discern which structure you're looking at just by its, uh, its, its relationship to the other three structures. Um, we can also talk about the rami communicantes, which are the fibers um, off of the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic trunk. When we talked about the autonomic nervous system, we discussed this structure in detail. Um, we discussed the uh, sympathetic ganglia, which are forming the sympathetic chain, or sorry, the autonomic ganglia, which are forming the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic trunk, um, and they are running on either side of the vertebral column. Uh, the azygous vein is another structure here. Now the veins that are draining, the intercostal veins that are draining in between each of the ribs will eventually communicate their flow to the larger azygous vein. And the azygous vein is located on the right side of the body. So if we were to orient ourselves, this would be right, this would be left because we're looking at the anterior view of the posterior thoracic wall. So the right side, the vessel is called the azygous vein, but on the left side, it's called the hemiazygous vein. And we can see it much better here. So there's one azygous on the right and one hemiazygous on the left. And the hemiazygous will drain the other um, intercostal veins on the left side up until the halfway point, and then it will cross the midline and communicate with the azygous vein, which will dump all of that blood into the, um, into the brachiocephalic trunk, um, which is communicating with the right atrium. Okay, other structures here, the thoracic duct, which is a very large lymphatic vessel. It's shown here in white. Now we spoke, uh, did we speak? I don't think we did yet, but we're gonna speak uh, about the lymphatic vessels, or you may be covering this right now in lecture, but the lymphatic vessels um, throughout the body that gather excess interstitial fluid and communicate that excess interstitial fluid from the lymphatic capillaries to larger lymphatic vessels. And then eventually that all culminates in the thoracic duct or the lymphatic, um, the, right, the left lymphatic duct. And that will eventually communicate the lymphatic fluid into the venous system via the, um, the internal jugular vein. And that is what gets the lymph fluid back into our circulatory system, back into our vascular 